Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Seth Schwartz, and I lead JP Morgan's uh, healthcare investment banking practice in Australia. And it's my great uh, honour and privilege to, uh, to introduce and welcome Leslie Chong, Managing Director of, of um, Imugene. Thank you, Seth. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a privilege and honour to talk about Imugene. We are an Australian stock exchange listed company. The ticker is IMU. And I'll walk you through our very extensive pipeline. So Imaging was formed in 2013, and I joined directly from Genentech to Imaging, San Francisco to Sydney, in 2015. And all the while, we have been amassing cancer vaccines and oncolytic viruses that really adds meaningful value and life to cancer patients. I, don't, I also don't mind telling you that when I joined in 2015, we were at a $5 million, uh, market cap. However, uh, at the end of 2021, we were at $2.5 billion. As you know, 2022 was a little, a little bit of an interesting scenario where all of us lost some value. But um, at the moment, we're just hovering over a billion, and I think that we will be on the rise because we have some meaningful products, as I say. Today, I am joined by Professor Yuman Fong, who is the inventor of our oncolytic viral therapy, as well as our chief business officer, Dr. Monil Shaw, and our chief chief medical officer, Giovanni Savaggi. At Imaging, we have three distinctive platforms. So Oncarlytics is the idea that an oncolytic virus can upregulate or express CD19 such that when you add a CD19 directed target, you can then obliterate solid tumor. We like the idea of a CF33 or oncolytic virus that can be transgene. And in this case, our check fact has a transgene of PDL1. And also our parental virus, our most prolific virus, we have this in the clinic with multiple solid tumors, and I'll go into the special nature of all these products in uh, future slides. Our B-cell immunotherapy is our most advanced in the clinic. We have three phase two studies, one in gastric cancer that has already read out an impressive overall survival. We also have an anti-PD-1 that is currently in non-small cell lung and have patients in complete remission. All of our IPs going out to 2037, 2038, meaning a long path to development and hopefully marketing. So our pipeline of clinical trials is quite impressive. We currently have five clinical trials ongoing, and just this year, 2023, we will enter into four clinical trials. I'll go right into our oncolytic viral therapy. This, an oncolytic virus, is it's in a simplest way, it infiltrates into every solid tumor, infects, multiplies at an accelerated rate, implodes, and then imparts that love onto other malignant cells. So this is exactly what our oncolytic virus can do. There are precedents for this, of course. In, 2000 and, in 2015, there was an approval called TVAC, currently in melanoma, Onkarin in China, as well as just the recent approval of Delitac in Japan in 2021. We love the idea of a vaccinia backbone virus in that we have robust efficacy. We've already seen plenty of efficacy in animals, but we're starting to see this in humans. It's well tolerated. The safety and toxicity is well controlled. Broad application across many solid tumors. Uh, we have place this into endocrine disease as well as triple negative breast cancer, uh, and it's all looking like it's replicating and doing really well in the patients. We can manufacture um, a huge amount, so the scalability is there. So the way Professor Yuan Fong created this unique oncolytic virus is that he took nine vaccinia virus strain, placed it into a cell, and in In a way, a fight club situation happened where viruses love to trade genetic material, and in this case, we were able to produce hundreds of clones or chimeric clones. That was placed against the National Cancer Institute line of 60 cancers. It killed it all. He was so curious, he created 30 more models and killed those too. 
this extremely well created oncolytic virus has been placed in many cell lines and animal lines, and as you can see here in pink, uh, colorectal, and lung, it completely suppressed the tumors, killing the cancer. This is what we were looking for to replicate in our clinical trials. We've already dosed thousands of different mice. And in the mice, in the autopsy, we saw all the organs be clean of virus, but, but the replication only happened in the malignant cells, the tumor cells. Also, the mice did not lose any weight, and this is all at a very low dose. Our oncolytic virus is unique in that we took a transgene and placed in what's called a human iodine symporter. This is used as a, not a therapeutic, but as a diagnostic. It's the ability for us to be able to trace this virus and where it replicates. When we took this mice, injected it, injected um, oncolytic virus in the left flank, and in a few days, you could see it travel to the right, right, the right flank, and your thyroid, stomach, and bladder already has iodine, so it lights up. But because of this HNS, you can see our virus travel from the left to the right and having an effect on that tumor. We've seen this in humans as well. We've just published uh, this, the HNS lighting up in triple negative breast cancer. We have a trial at the City of Hope. We're currently in cohort three. We're still at a very low dose, but yet we're seeing some interesting effects including what we published at the San Antonio Breast Cancer just recently. And as you can see, the HNS, the human iodine symporter, is lighting up, as well as recruitment of CD8 and our PDL1. We like the idea of the parental virus because it is the most potent and prolific virus, and we took this into not only intratumoral, but intravenous, because we think that it has an abscopal effect and because the ability to trace, we have placed this into multiple tumor types, and it's an intratumoral and IV. We've completed, we're just about to complete cohort two, and we already have an agreement with the FDA to go right into a combination with pembrolizumab. So we're going to be doing that in the next few months. The idea that an oncolytic virus can express certain targets uh, was something that was brought together by Professor Yuman Fong and Dr. Saul Priceman. And in this case, we know that our oncolytic virus has an abhorrent hate for malignant tumors, and it only replicates in solid tumors. When it replicates, the idea that it's going to shuttle up a CD19 flag, that when you add a CD19 target, such as a CAR-T or a bispecific, you can then obliterate that solid tumor. It's this idea that you can mark and kill approach to a solid tumor that has never existed before. This is a very novel idea, and it is a paradigm shift in how we can treat un, un, uh, um, unattainable solid tumors with this product. We've seen this preclinically, and this is all published on the cover of Science Translational Medicine, where you see that pink outline, that's CD19 covering the cells. The idea that in a small level of infection, the infection happened quickly and, and swiftly in many of those tumor types here, pank, prostate, ovarian, and by itself, the oncolytic virus did a great job, that gray line on the right graph. Suppression of the tumors happened quite well. However, when you added the CD19 truncated model, it completely arrested that tumor type. What's so interesting is that we dosed this mice and then we cured it. We we introduced the disease and it cured it again. So we see a memory and a durability that we, we are hoping to see in humans. We're going to go um, have an FDA IND very soon and Q1 of 23, and then you will see patients being dosed on this particular product very soon. Again, on the cover of Science Translational Med, that green is the viral spread that happened quite quickly when you combined it with the CD19 target therapy. 
We already have a, a collaboration with a company called Cellularity. They have an allergen, allergenic CD19 CAR T. Also with Eureka, who has an autologous CD19. And we're currently working on preclinical work with Aravella. All three of our posters would work with Psychart 19 with Cellularity, as well as Eureka and Blin Saito from Amgen. We have been able to publish this at the world famous uh, cancer conference called SITSI just back in November. So I'll just move on to our B-cell immunotherapy. This is the one that we have the most amount of, of data with. This is the idea that instead of your T cells creating antibodies or a monoclonal or synthetic antibody being injected into you, this is an idea that your B cells then can create an antibody against a certain target. And in this case, we have an anti-HER2 as, an, as, as well as a PD-1, <clears throat> basically making your immune system into an antibody factory. We've already seen safety. I'll show you some efficacy, some impressive efficacy, where we saw a, almost a six-month departure from chemo versus um, Hervax uh, in combination with chemo. We've seen patients come in um, after three years and still have the antibody production. This is in gastric uh, patients. And the usability is wonderful in that you're not sitting on a chair for two hours getting an infusement. Some of our patients were able to come in every three to six months to just get an injection and leave the hospital. During the time of COVID, this was a beautiful thing for a lot of our, a lot of our patients. Also, it's one-tenth of the cost of goods to make um, rather than a monoclonal antibody. It has been a seamless production where we've added an adjuvant and a conjugate of Prim-197 and Montanide that created this long-lasting antibody. We've completed a phase two and with an overall survival of over six months differential between the randomized arms, and also um, we've seen a hazard ratio of 0.518. Nice separation of curve there with a duration of a medium duration of response at 30 weeks. Safety looked great. We only had one SAE, and that was um, that death was due to complication from COVID. There was a case study where a patient who was randomized to the chemo arm. Were, was progressing, that red um, dots are all chemo patients that never produced any antibodies as expected. This one patient actually came off the study because they were progressing, went on a treatment called tratuzumab or Herceptin, came in for their end of the treatment visits, and you can see their antibody production was similar or the same as our own B-cell created antibodies. So all the blue lines and the dots are those that were, were randomized to the Hervax arm. So with this data, we're actually taking Hervax into the second and third line gastric population where we're combining with pembrolizumab. We're also looking at a neoadjuvant or pre-surgery setting where we're dosing with Hervax and uh, in combination with avalumab. And because we like the idea of your B cells creating the antibodies against a certain target because we've seen safety, toxicity controlled, we think that PD-1 vax is revolutionary in that you can create a similar effect that we've seen in Hervax with an anti-PD-1. And indeed, uh, we have already dose escalated in a non-small cell lung cancer population. These are progressed patients who've come on to our study. We have one in particular patient who's come on after they have progressed off of pembrolizumab and then currently living two years or more um, remiss uh, in a complete remission as a complete responder. We have some partial responder, as well as uh, stable disease in the dose escalation arm. We're going to um, combine our PD-1 with a tezoluzumab or Tencentric from Roche. We're going to go into a treatment-naive population, as well as progressed population, and PD-L1 agnostic population in that combination. 
in the next one to twelve months, you can anticipate. Uh, value inflection points such as FDA IND, some interim readouts, as well as first patient in. I'm really excited about the oncarolytics, the idea that you can infiltrate into every solid tumor, make that into one disease, and then to add a CD19 CAR T or, or a bispecific to create a situation where you have endogenous T cell recruitment and as well as the implosion from the virus. So that's going to happen as early as this year. So we're quite excited about that. So our market cap is currently around um, a, a billion, and um, J.P. Morgan happens to be one of our largest shareholders. So in summary... We have five unique assets already in the clinic or about to hit the clinic. We have three unique platforms, and they're true platforms in that within about anywhere between six weeks to six months amount of time, you can create another construct with our products. We already have three scientific preclinical collaboration with Cellularity, Eureka, and Aravella. We're addressing numerous solid tumor types, and we have five clinical studies currently ongoing, producing data, and we'll have four additional ones just this year, 2023. We already have two supply uh, agreements from Merck, Serona, Pfizer, as well as um, Genentech Roche. That is the end of my presentation.